Many people accurately describe Lake Okeechobee as the heart of the Everglades, but lately our mismanagement has caused the worst damage the lake has ever seen. With back-to-back -back hurricanes in 2016 and 2017 and a major rain event in 2018, the lake has been kept at high levels for the past three years and now it is on the verge of collapse. There are three government agencies that regulate the lake. The Army Corps of Engineers, which is in charge of flood control, the South Florida Water Management District, which is in charge of environmental things like water use permits and managing the STAs, and then there's the FWC, which is in charge of fish, wildlife, and invasive plant control. The FWC doesn't spray the invasive plants themselves. They hire it out to private contractors. These contractors use airboats to spray the vegetation and use many different chemicals, but the one that concerns scientists most is glyphosate. It is a known carcinogen and it takes a long time to break down when it enters the water. They spray for several different plants, but the three main ones are hydrilla, water hyacinth, and water lettuce. All three of these plants are very fast growing and are not native to Florida. Water hyacinth and water lettuce are both floating plants and can be easily sprayed because all of their leaves are above water. Hydrilla, on the other hand, is a submerged plant, so it is much harder to control. In order for the herbicide to work properly, it has to come into contact with the plant's leaves, so you have to blast the water with lots of pressure. Hydrilla grows into very dense mats, which is bad for boaters, but its dense characteristics makes it one of the best filter plants for taking nitrogen and phosphorus out of the water, something that the lake desperately needs. All plants remove nitrogen and phosphorus, no matter if they are invasive or not. Since the lake is void of most of the native plants thanks to the spraying in the high water, we need to stop the spraying when the lake reaches a certain level. There is no plan in place to monitor the spraying successes. There isn't any goals or benchmarks that take into consideration the natural die-offs due to high water. So every day, they load up a half dozen airboats and send these guys out to spray whatever they can find. And that came straight from the mouth of the South Florida Water Management District. Just rely on spraying. We need to look at multiple approaches to how we manage this vegetation because as she said, um, we don't even have a way to measure progress. We're just going at it every year as we can, but there's not even been a percent reduction year over year that can be measured, which to me is concerning. That should concern you as well. They have been spraying this vegetation for decades and they don't even have a plan in place to measure the reduction? Are you friggin' kidding me? The spraying has reached a point where the contractors are not finding any large patches of invasive plants. So they're just spraying tiny patches and in most cases, single plants. Canals that are irregularly sprayed are void of all plant matter, including the native ones. These chemicals stay in the water for months and continue to kill all the vegetation. This is a canal that hasn't been sprayed, full of nice healthy plants, and best of all, no poison. Unfortunately, the lake doesn't look like that now. More and more areas are looking like dead zones. Everywhere you look, there's birds and wildlife struggling to catch a meal. When the dead plants fall to the bottom, they create a thick layer of rotting organic matter that smothers all life on the bottom. As it rots, it releases all the nitrogen and phosphorus that the plant took out of the water when it was alive. Then when the chemical herbicides finally do break down, they also turn into phosphorus. So the lake gets a double dose of nutrients from all the spraying. Whenever a plant dies off in any ecosystem, Mother Nature has to step in and replace the plant with another one. This is what's happening right now in Lake Okeechobee. Unfortunately, the plant that's replacing these aquatic plants is blue-green algae. Algae is one of the best plants to take nutrients out of the water. That's why you see it in every nutrient-rich waterway. It's not a coincidence that we've seen a dramatic increase in blue-green algae the last few years. We've basically seen the same amount of runoff in the last 30 years. It's because we haven't had the natural plants in the lake that normally take most of the nutrients out. In 2004 and 2005, Lake Okeechobee got hit with back-to-back -back hurricanes, which left behind record high water levels. Most of the vegetation got wiped out and the lake was in the worst shape it had seen in its long history. Scientists began noticing a huge decrease in snakes, frogs, fish, and invertebrates. The high water was having a major impact on all the wildlife. In 2007, Mother Nature came to the rescue with a major drought that dropped the lake to its all-time low of just 8.8 .8 feet. 
Then in May, she sent us a lightning bolt that started a major fire that consumed 10,000 acres of land within the dike, which was underwater months earlier. The fire could be seen from space, and it burned off all the dead vegetation, along with all the dried out muck that had once smothered the bottom. What happened the next year was quite miraculous. New vegetation began to grow, and with that came clear water, which triggered an explosion of insects, frogs, snakes, and best of all, bass. It was the single most successful comeback in the lake's history, all orchestrated and executed by Mother Nature without any human interference. By 2009, all of the fishing guides around the lake were catching 50 to 100 bass a day. The water was clear and they could now sight fish for bass, something that they hadn't been able to do in a long time. The clearer water and the clean sand bottom promotes the growth of one of the most important grasses in Lake Okeechobee, eelgrass. It grows on the bottom and is probably the best at creating habitat for aquatic critters. Every square yard of eelgrass contains 67 grass shrimp, 1,900 segmented worms, and 13,000 midges. All three of these critters are very important fish food. The fish weren't the only critters that benefited from the clean water. Apple snails made a huge comeback, and the two birds that feed on them also saw their numbers increase. Snail kites and limpkins, who saw their nesting activity drop off a cliff in 2005, 6, and 7, were enjoying a lot more nesting activity in 2008. Limpkins were seen raising up to six chicks. Since each chick needs dozens of snails every day, the parents have to catch hundreds of snails per day, something that would have been impossible the years before. Fast forward to today, we are in the same situation as we were back in 2006. The lake has been at high levels for three years, and now it is on the verge of collapse again. But right now, it looks like we might be headed for a drought. This will give us a rare opportunity to do what Mother Nature taught us back in 2007, and that is burn off all the dead vegetation so that the lake can start with a clean slate. We need to be ready to burn off every inch of land around the lake if it drops much lower. So let's tell our officials to end the spraying permanently and get ready for a major burn on Lake Okeechobee. We gotta get this right because we can't afford for the heart of the Everglades to stop beating.